Hey, you're listening to the Alt Show with Elias Whitfield. Wait, that's what it is, right? Yep, yep. Okay, great. Be a, a little more excited about that. Yeah, but I don't care. Yeah, you don't want to care. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, maybe, like, go somewhere else because this f- sucks. Hey, this is the Alt Show with Elias Whitfield. This episode of the Alt Show is brought to you by Evolution 1079. Hey, how's it going? I'm Elias Whitfield, and welcome to the Alt Show. Today, I'm doing something a bit different. I've decided to get my close buddy Chris Den Hardhog on the show. And as I've mentioned before, I'm currently attending BCIT's Radio Arts and Entertainment program. And my job for the last three weeks is to be the music director of Evolution 1079. And one of my jobs for this session was to get an artist into the station to do an acoustic session and interview. But I said, you know what? I'm not a fan of that idea because I think really artists do their best performances when they're in a place that they're comfortable, like their home, their studio, wherever that may be. So I decided to bring the station to my buddy Chris. I packed it all up in a bag, all my mics and everything, went down to the downtown east side where he lives and set up in his apartment a little studio for the day and we basically just hung out, chatted about music and I let him do what he does best play beautiful acoustic ballads. This one might be one of my all-time favorite songs, at least from the last few months. It's called A Dollar 67. I hope you enjoy. With a dollar 67 And my darling up the river Oh, this world is only ever What it's made to be Still 40 short of heaven For an apple falling farther Oh, this wall it only ever reads Like clockwork to me And you can have it all Just save me a piece to fall on to and you can have the moon just save yourself a slice to shine on through songs about <laughs> it's about basically all the shit that goes through your head when you have dollar 67 in your pocket yeah and you have nowhere to go <clears throat> i came and i lived here when i moved back yeah from the coast just a room downstairs my buddy was was rent- leasing this building i said okay we've come back to town we're gonna start a band and playing music writing songs it's like sweet what do you need? I need a bed, a fork, and a guitar. So I came, <laughs> came back. All I had, wrote that song. All I had was a bed, a fork, and a guitar, and the dollar sixty-seven. And it basically wrote itself. 
<laughs> it's funny because that song really it says a lot of things that I just feel like I it, actually my dad woke me up in the middle of the night I was in bed and he's like Elias you need to hear this song oh, wow and, and I, I came out and I, I, I was kind of pissed because I'm like half asleep I was pissed off and I was like well, what? and I sat down and I went that was worth waking me up for <laughs> And then I remember I, I literally I only do it with a few songs, but when a song is that good, I go to the point where I need to listen to it over and over again. And I came to work one day and it, I just kept on repeating that song. Because it was where my mental state was at at the time, too. It was just like it said what needed to be said. So cheers to that. Yeah, it sums up a lot of things that <clears throat> everyone feels every day, I guess. I mean, I had a dollar sixty-seven in my pocket, but how many people out there have eighty thousand dollars in debt and are like <laughs> on their deathbed or something? <clears throat> yeah. Well, at least they don't have to pay it off once they're dead. <laughs> their family does. It's a good strategy. Yeah. Not for the kids. As we move along here on the El Show, this is another one of Chris's songs. It's called Confession. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> In regards to that song, um, actually that song's about uh, kind of falling in love for the first time. Okay. And like uh, admitting you have emotions <laughs> and feelings for someone, I guess. Going to that vulnerable state. Yeah. Yeah. Was it about the first time you felt it, or just the first time? Jesus? Oh yeah, by the first time I felt it. I mean, I was falling in love with this girl at the time, and and uh, and again, it was just another one of those good songs that. I mean, I was writing a lot at the time, but this song, in particular, I, I woke up in the middle of the night. I was literally writing like, eight a.m. to twelve p.m. every day. Oh wow! Just one of those summers where you get just throw yourself into something so I was like I had all these ideas and melodies and stuff in my head and then, and then this was happy and then I woke up at you know one in the morning or whatever three in the morning picked up a guitar and as long as it takes you to listen to it that's how long it took to write it and it all just, it just came, came out in one go one go yeah wow and you said this song was like ten years old 
Yeah, it was probably written about ten years ago. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and it stuck around with you this long. Well, it's, it's a good song. Really, that's all you can ones do. I've probably recorded and rewritten it half a dozen times, different formats and rhythms and. How many times has it changed throughout that? Oh, the chords and lyrics. The lyrics and melody never change. No, no, it's no. the same story over and over. It's transposed a little bit in spots and like different harmonies, whatever. But yeah, the 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 lyric and melody and and uh, chording under it. It's, it's it's good the way it is. You yeah. can't you can't overwrite a song, right? <laughs> well, that's true. I mean, uh, f- I mean, if I've done that, sat on a song for a month and rewritten twenty different versions of it, <clears> or a year, <throat> or two. But uh, there's a lot of theories about songwriting that songwriters have <laughs> that works for them and doesn't work for other people, and some people it does work. And what's your songwriting process? Um, just keep writing. Before I used to start with, uh, with guitar, because I was a guitar player since I was like 15 years old, so it always, that was my first instrument I'd go to, as far as songwriting, I played piano before that, but mm-hmm. when I started doing my own music, it was guitar, so at first it started with riffs and guitar stuff, and then I'd just build a melody on that, a lot of times with guitar. Yeah. But the lyrics, uh, I wasn't really a lyric writer at first, I'd say, like, uh, lyrics, lyrics have become my, my, the way I write songs now. Yeah, I was gonna say, because, I mean, going back to, like, Dollar Sixty Seven or Circus or any of these songs you've written, it's like, it's, for me, it's always been the lyrics that have, like, really tied me to the song and been like, wow, this is a tune. Well, that's good, that's the, in- that's, that's the intention, that's... And that's, I think, what sticks around. I mean, when I was on the coast, <clears throat> before I moved back here, I locked myself in a cabin up there for like a year and a half. Started picking up guitar again and writing. And I kind of fell into that same format I did before, you know, throw, throw yourself into logic and do all this cool shit. <laughs> Reverb. And, uh, six layered guitars and two bass tracks. and. <laughs> It's cool. It's cool. You know, you can do some cool rhythmic stuff in there. But uh, started writing, writing, and I was writing pretty heavy. Like, I probably wrote about sixty or eighty songs up there in in in, in that year or the last year I was there when I started seriously writing again. And I uh, thought, okay, let's 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 start doing something again. <laughs> so I uh, I had a producer buddy here in town, Darren Gron. He's uh, he's a really very good engineer he does a little production as well I think I don't know I've never worked with him on that level he's just been more of like an acquaintance or a, or a friend gotcha. who I th- throw music to so I'll send him all these songs and stuff and <clears throat> it's like yeah it's a cool beat it's a cool riff it's a cool progression yeah it's it's, it's, uh, it's kind of catchy but, but, uh, but it wasn't 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 there yet right yeah <clears throat> so then I kept writing kept writing and then finally I wrote this one song and he said, uh, okay, let's uh, let's go for a beer. I can take you out for a beer. <laughs> <laughs> so I came into town and uh, um, took him out for a beer and you know, he just he's he's at that level, he's at that elite level, he does this for a living every day, all day. Yeah. He he it's can say what he wants. He he just tore a hole in me. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Which is good, you know, you need to hear that stuff. And But there was one thing that tied it all together that I left there with. And it just propelled me after that. Like after I, you know, healed from the wounds. Yeah. But he... First first kind of thing he said that kind of start, I started thinking about was melody. Like, where's, where's the melody and all blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Just like the depths of melody, you know. You can have a, a two-note melody, a three-note melody, but... And they work. They can work, I guess. Some of the simpler songs it can work for, but you want you to get more complex. Yeah, you have to. You have to pay attention to that stuff. Gotta say, Chris was definitely paying attention when he wrote this one. It's a brand new song. No one's ever heard it before. It's animalist. On. <laughs>
So why do you choose drop D? Why is that your, like your go-to tuning? Um, it's kind of a, it's kind of a easier, it's kind of a, it's kind of an easy way out. Because everything's a chord. Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, I guess I guess also the style you play. Like I like to play. So I'm a guitar player. A lot of guitar players who write, I find, mm. write, like dabble and drop D. It's a little. Uh, Is that your new band name? Dabble and drop D. <laughs> better copyright that. Yeah. Before I release this. <laughs> No, um, I don't know. It's just, it's just, it's just guitar technique, I guess, is what it comes down to. Like, uh, some guys, if they play more, um, if the, I, I find the more trained guys play in regular tuning, yeah, because that's how guitar theory and technique kind of teaches you. But me, because I started on piano first. Oh, really? Yeah, piano is my first instrument, or introduced me to yeah. music theory, <clears throat> and then I took that theory and applied it to guitar. I knew I my ear was already trained, yeah. so I could um, I could find things like a lot of people if they pick up guitar for the first time, they'll be like, oh, there's so many frets and so many strings. Yeah. What do I do? Well, if you understand music theory and all that, Get this forward. is there and that's there. You got seven to play with. Yeah, plus your your sharps and flats. Of course, yeah, that would throw in a that's, little bit. That's that's actually what I tell everyone when they're all daunted by music as well. It's only twelve notes, man. So yeah. think do the math. Yeah, there's so many possibilities. There's a lot of possibilities. Yeah. What was the music that like? What first got you into music in the first place? Um. Uh, I guess just m growing up in, mu in a musical family, I guess. My mom, she, uh, well, my mom's side anyway, she was in a, her whole family, my grandpa, he all, every time we saw him, he'd have a, a ukulele or a guitar, we'd all be singing, or back in those days, everyone had a piano in their house, so you'd have a piano and everything would end up being music at some point. Plus, I think music was a little more dominant in households back then because we didn't have all internet and everything right so yeah. all you did was you you know played you went out and went skateboarding or came inside and filled around on the piano or you played with your dad's records because that's all the entertainment you had yeah, the same records <coughs> over and over again yeah but they're they're good records my dad was a dj in his 20s for 10 or 20 years or something so he always had these weird crazy old 50s and 60s records like stuff like Tiny Tim and Napoleon and oh, cool. like weird you look these up now and yeah they're just like novelty songs <laughs> but it was uh, you know the bird is the word You know, songs like that. It's like really? So th that's where your beginnings came, eh? Was more... 50s and 60s, yeah. And then where did the uh, the grunging... In? Well, I'm trying to think, because you are you stem very alt-rocky. <clears throat> Is... Well, uh, also, I, I, I was lucky, though. I um, When I was 16, I discovered this band called Nirvana. You know, that was my generation, 16 years old. Nirvana, go to the record store, and hey, that's a cool album cover. Oh, yeah, I heard it's a good band. Like, you know how <coughs> people who grew up in the 60s, you know, the Beatles consumed them? Oh, okay, so yeah, that makes it's kind sense. kind of that, you know, when the, when the Beatles hit back then, um, you know, I heard this older guy describe it as, it just, what, how many households in America were listening to the Beatles on the, on the TV at the time or something, or... Or how much it influenced after that well the same is being said about Nirvana in that they had that effect but to not the degree of the Beatles like 
I heard an older guy say, well, if the Beatles were on a scale of 1 to 100, they were 100, Nirvana was like a 10 or a 20 or something. But it, but it was no. enough to... Yeah, it still had a cultural push or pulse that it captured. It was the music of that generation. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, it was. But, you know, a lot had been done up to that point, so it's, it's kind of getting more a little harder and harder to break new ground, you know? So do you think now it's impossible, or do you still think you can break the ground? Um, I think there's always new ground to be broken, definitely. But, uh, like the, you know say it's all with it's all with done or whatever but I think that the thing that ties all everything together and keeps keep push keeps it pushing forward is uh, um, the you know the stories behind it the uh, the emotion behind it the um, you know cause so, somebody can sit behind a computer I actually had one of my songs sent into uh, I sent it off the song confession actually I sent it to this uh, thing where they can actually generate whether or not that's going to be a hit song or if it's a good song based on the melody progression, the chord progression, the song. I don't know how they do it, but they have this graph. And so was Confession one of those songs that fit that graph? Well, it's not a graph you fit, but you can you can send a, a song in and they'll put it in and they'll graph it out for you. Oh, okay. And then they'll say, well, this is... it's ones, ones that show up in this part of the graph, then they're good songs somehow because I guess you could input every song up to that point and map it out mathematically well and then pop musically what's that one chord progression one five seven four or something I I think I got it wrong but the same chord progression in blink 182's damn it is the same as wonderwall that's the same as like just you can go and they're all the same yeah and that's what it is it's um you know, in music theory, there's, uh, there's, you know, like the circle of fists and, um, there are, there are progressions that sound good to the ear for a reason and they're named something because, because of how they, uh, you know, they are theoretically in music. I don't know how to describe it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, here's I just the thing, hear though, play it. Because music was created for things people couldn't actually say. Yeah, like, like actually, I actually uh, saw this poster the other day and it said, music is what feelings sound like. Yes, exactly. And that just basically sums it up. Yeah. And, and you can actually even break it down if you're all into that yoga. It all does line up and everybody's right to some degree that, yes, yeah. this does, yes, this, yes, this, yes, this. But when it comes all together as a whole, like you know about that, where yeah. like the shock, the, the what the, are they again? The chakra, like this yeah, chakra. Yeah. I don't know. What Heart called. chakra. There's the that one chakra. Yeah. Yeah, that one resonates at 457 hertz or something. So if you hit oh. a note at 400, or so it's hitting like, that part of your body. It's stimulating it or yeah. or something. Well, because this girl just told me about that. Her friend went to off to a retreat, and all they did was played frequencies it was like a frequency uh, therapy yeah. thing yeah and you get that many hertz and it just vibes you I guess that there's no other word you it can pick for it stimulates that energy you know it's the same like in uh, um, Chinese medicine you know that's all acupuncture is it's just it's stimulating the chi in your body's meridian or energy um, channels or endpoints that's cool yeah yeah, apparently also uh, E flat tuning is the way the world's tuned or something. My dad watched some weird documentary where it's like if you boil down everyday sounds or something like that, everything is in <clears throat> E flat. I believe it. Yeah. There's, so, there's there's so much science and and technology and shit out there these days that can I swear by the way yeah I know you oh, okay. swear as much as you want <laughs> fuck it fuck it <laughs> there's so much shit out there these days that they've you know figured all these fucking magnetic patterns and um and and uh, yeah sub sonic I don't know frequencies of weird stuff and goes back through thousands of years of people uh, building things in the ground to resonate certain frequencies yeah. to like stimulate a village or something or 
Is it a band name? Stimulated Village? <laughs> oh, that's a bad band name. No, that's a real... That band is... What? I'm trying to think. Or YMCA. Who are they again? I forget. Village people. Oh, that's maybe why I thought it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what, though? I gotta say something about that, man. Picking a band name is hard. Yeah. That's, the Jesus that's a hard thing. The Jesus Band Aids, yeah. That's being a lion suspend. <laughs> and it like, is exactly that. He has a he had a band aid on his keyboard. Yeah. I like I like how those things can happen though. You can just have those little little jokes. Well it's also because both you came from a religious family, right? Yeah. And how has that affected your music at all? <clears throat> uh I don't know, we did a lot of music in church and stuff. It actually, it was technically it was considered a cult I grew up in. If you look up in the book of cults now, it's which cult it's in there? Uh, we only just talked about it. Okay, fair. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, we uh, is it influenced music? Uh, no, I think I think music's been there. Separate. Yeah, music yeah. is its own thing. It, it spans all that shit, religion and and. Uh, do you think it's more just like part of like the human experience? Well, I mean, if you, if you think about it, <clears throat> what are the only things that lasted the test of time? And that is the true test of a good song yeah. and music, in my opinion. And the only things that have lasted through the test of time is uh, the arts. Yeah. Art Actually, is very true. Music. So there you go. That's been my interview with Chris Den Hartog, and I hope you enjoyed it on the old show. Remember, as Chris has said, himself it's all about the music the history and all the bits in between till next time i'm gonna leave you with a song that was the first song chris ever wrote when he got back to playing guitar it's a little lullaby <laughs> oh it's daunting oh it's daunting well what haven't i told This truth is getting me old The star in me Will rest in peace Oh, it's daunting Oh, it's daunting there's truth to every joke A child knows I gave my money away Well, what's left to say?